I have been an incredible admirer of the founder of this movement for as long as I can remember now, which, you know, because I'm an old guy, is not so many years, but there it is. Uh, um, Cenk has been an inspiration, and what he has built and what all of you have built, I think we will look back to remember as the kernel, the beginning, the start of bringing this republic around. So, when Mike says, I'm going to get up here and teach you some more, I'm not going to teach you anything. You know this issue as well as anybody in the nation, I think. What I want to do is to mark out where I am. And when I can mark out where I am, I hope in some questions we can get some debate, uh, maybe uh, a little bit more fierce than I understand the debate with my friend John Pudner was. Um, but it's extremely uh, great to see John here, too, because Pudner is also an incredibly important part of this movement because as you see at the end, in my view, the single most important move we can make is to find a way to turn off phones, but also <laughs> but also to build the coalition between people of different values and different views, but committed to the fundamental value that we have a republic that represents everyone equally. OK, so here's the first frame. I'm not actually sure that what's necessary for us to succeed is even possible in America today. I'm not sure. Because the reality is what's necessary for us to succeed is to find a way for us to rise above the partisans in American politics, to find a way not to deny our differences, because there are real differences, not to minimize the importance of the values that we on the left really, really care about, like single-payer health care, or a minimum wage that really makes it possible for people to live, or climate change, not to deny the significance of those issues, but to recognize that at certain moments, a republic needs to pause and to fix itself. And the only way it ever fixes itself truly is to step above the partisan divide and to reach across to people of honor on the other side and to say, let's put the arguments aside for a moment, the arguments of substance that we believe so much in, and let's focus on what we know we have to fix to make it possible for a democracy to work. Because we need to remember that before we were Republicans or Democrats, we were citizens first, and what we believe, what we believe in this movement, in this Article 5 movement, what we believe is that constitutional change is necessary in America. Now, I've spent many years arguing that we can get a lot without constitutional change. We could fix a lot without actually changing our Constitution. But that shouldn't be confused with the view that we don't need constitutional change. I think fundamentally our Constitution has to be significantly altered to make it possible for democracy to continue to function. And that part of our reform movement is what you are so central to bringing about. So we can ask this question, what constitutional change? And the differences that I think we need to focus on are not as important as what unites this movement. And it's more importantly that we need to find a way that, to express what we believe. And what we believe is that we need this change in the basic frame of our government, and a change not controlled by Congress. Because what we believe in this movement is that we believe Congress is the problem. Congress is the institution that has allowed the corruption of this democracy to evolve. And that's something people on the left believe and people on the right believe. This is what unites us and why we are here in an Article 5 movement, the failed branch of our government is the institution we have to find a way to fix. And that fact is a huge problem 
for the reform movement, for this republic. Because if you think about the failure of a judge, a judge being proven as corrupt or an alcoholic or just insane, our Constitution has built in a system for dealing with a bad judge. We impeach that judge. Or if you could imagine, I don't know if you can imagine, a terrible, <laughs> you, guys are, you guys are smart. Just like shut your eyes for a minute. Just imagine a constitutionally insanely terrible president. Our Constitution has embedded a way to deal with that problem. Either we don't select him in the next election or we impeach him. That is the plan that is given to us in our constitutional doctrine. But Congress, in our Constitution is essentially untouchable. The institution is untouchable because we don't elect a Congress. We elect members to Congress. And what that means is in our voting, there is no one who we elect with the means or the motive to fix Congress directly. Now, this problem was not completely missed by the framers. Indeed, I think some of the framers saw this as one of the flaws in their original constitutional design. Just a couple days before the first draft of the Constitution was released, George Mason noticed this flaw because the then structure for amending the Constitution said that the only people who could amend the Constitution was Congress. It was Congress that would propose the amendments and Congress that could ratify the amendments by sending them out to the states. And what Mason said was, what if Congress is the problem? As he wrote, no, as he spoke on the floor of the convention, no amendments of the proper kind would ever be obtained by the people if the government should become oppressive. And what that did was to lead to this least understood clause of our Constitution, the clause which you understand better than most law professors, Article 5's convention clause. Because what Mason recognized and convinced the convention of is that we needed a path around the corrupted institution of Congress. A path that would allow the people through their states to rally, to fix the Constitution, to avoid what could be the alternative, which would be a revolution. Now what's astonishing to me is the ignorance the really astonishing ignorance about this clause. But the good news here is that it's bipartisan <laughs> ignorance. <laughs> so for example, let me pick on somebody on our own side here for a second. This, this piece um, in the, uh, February 2016 describes this platform put together by a group of, quote, reform groups. Um, as it's described in the article, efforts are being undertaken in state legislatures to pass resolutions calling for a constitutional convention to send various constitutional amendments to the states for ratification. If these efforts are successful, it would result in the nation's first constitutional convention since 1787 convention that adopted the Constitution. It would also create the opportunity for a runaway convention that could rewrite any constitutional right or protection currently available to American citizens. <clears throat> this is, this is, this is conventional Wisdom? No. This is conventional ignorance in American politics today. This is what both sides believe. And we should be, rec we should be clear about how totally confused this rhetoric is. So let's start with these words, constitutional convention. The reality is an Article 5 convention is not what constitutional theorists understand as a constitutional convention. What a constitutional convention is, is a convention that has the power to blow up the existing constitution, to make up its own rules, to do whatever the hell it wants, because it speaks, as the French put it, and if it's put it in French, then it sounds more authentic, with the constituent power 
the constituent power, the power of the people, is expressed in a constitutional convention. But that is not what Article 5 is. Article 5 is not a constitutional convention the way 1787's convention was. The convention of our framers was a constitutional convention because was, I'm sure you know, they took their old constitution and just threw it away. They violated the rules for amending their constitution to get the new constitution. And they did so believing they had the power when it went out to the states and states convention to speak for the people. And they did so, they created this convention outside of the Articles of Confederation themselves. The Articles of Confederation had no provision for calling a convention. This was a convention expressing what Jefferson believed and America at the time understood that a people have an unalienable right to alter or abolish their constitution. That's what they were doing. But I don't know whether I know anyone calling for a constitutional convention in that sense today. Maybe there are. You know, maybe we're going to have to if we fail long enough. But right now, I don't know anybody calling for that sort of a convention. What I think we're trying to do is to call the convention spoken of in the plain language of this really hard to read document. <laughs> a convention for proposing amendments. It's a convention for a particular purpose. And that purpose defines its limits. Indeed, Article 5 goes on to describe expressly that whatever this convention does has no power until it is ratified by three-fourths of the states. So this language, this power created by the Constitution is something fundamentally different from what the framers of our Constitution were doing. They were giving us a power for proposing amendments, a power limited by the express terms of Article 5. The only power this convention has is the power for proposing amendments and it cannot, in that sense, run away in the way people talk about the original constitutional convention running away. The only thing it can do is fail. Now, they say, though, our opponents, the people who oppose the idea of an Article 5 convention, they say, no, 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 it did before run away, this thing you call a convention, so it can run away again. And that's their fear, that if we created a convention that has this echo from what happened in 1787, it'll run away as that article described and change the Constitution willy-nilly, violating the rules. The First Amendment is gone. The Fourteenth Amendment is gone. The Second Amendment is repeated over and over and over and over again. <laughs> they say that. 1787 convention is a precedent. And in the law of constitutional law, we have to look to precedents and recognize they can be repeated. And if they can re be repeated, then we should recognize a convention is always available to destroy the existing constitution. OK, so let's just be clear about what they do then, meaning what exactly is the precedent of 1787? And to answer that question, we're going to play a little game. What I'm going to ask you to do is to identify at what step in the process was the law or the Constitution or whatever you want to say violated? When did they cross the line between what was legally permissible and what was a violation of existing law? Okay, so. The steps in 1787 back then were, number one, there was a rogue convention that was pulled together. So Annapolis in 1786 had failed. And even without, a, uh, even without um, uh, um, the presence of a quorum to enable them to discuss anything, they said, let's think about getting together in Philadelphia in 1787. And so they said, eh, this sounds like a good idea. We'll get together in 1787. And they sent this word back to Congress and out to the states. And the states said, OK, we can have a convention 
in Philadelphia beginning in May 1787. But what that convention can do is just consider amendments to the Articles of Confederation. And the very first act they did was to close the doors, seal the windows, pull the shades down, and say, to hell with that. We're not going to sit around wasting our time talking about amending this failed document. We're going to write a new constitution. So the rogue convention ignored the limits given to them by the states and Congress about what they could do. They then recommended to Congress at the, end of, at, uh, at the end of their convention, four months later in September, they recommended to, their con to Congress a new constitution. And in, critically, they recommended that that new constitution be adopted in a way that was inconsistent with the rules set down in, our, in the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation said, a new constitution has to be adopted, or a new amendment to the constitution has to be adopted unanimously. And what these guys said is, oh, we have a better idea. Better than unanimously, what about if nine states agree? You know, that's close enough for government work, right? So nine states. <laughs> if we get nine states, that's a legitimate amendment. So they said, we have a recommendation. Our recommendation is you say nine states, and when those nine states have ratified in convention, then we're going to recognize a new constitution. Then step four is Congress listened to this, read the constitution, and said, OK, sounds like a good idea to us. And so Congress adopted the recommendation of the convention and sent it out to the states saying, we'd like you to consider whether to ratify this. And the states debated it. And you know, there's an amazing history told in a book called Coup. Um, uh, by my colleague Mike Klarman, which is about a thousand page book, so if you ever need to sleep, you can you know, bring this book to your bedside. But the amazing story of the ratification here, which his point is just how tenuous the ratification was. There were so many moments when it could have gone the other way. And the, fra the framers were so genius in their political strategy of where they would bring it first to make it create the momentum necessary to bring them over the final line. But Congress adopted the recommendation, sent it out and said, do it according to this recommendation. And of course, eventually, it was ratified. All right. Which of these steps was illegal? All of them? All right. Was the first step illegal? I mean, you know, they were told, get together and think about this. But they said, eh, no, we don't want to do that. Is that against the law? <laughs> I mean, they just didn't do what they were told. If, they, if doing not, not doing what you were told is against the law, then Congress has been illegal every day of its life. <laughs> There's nothing illegal in just getting a bunch of people together and talking about what they're going to, you know, what you think a new constitution should be. We could talk about a new constitution. You wouldn't be illegal. I know that would depress some of you because you want to sort of be rebels and get arrested, but you wouldn't get arrested. <laughs> for sitting down and talking about a con So number one is not illegal. Number two, ignoring the limits of what they were told they could talk about. Is that illegal? Hell no, it was a free country. You could talk about whatever the hell you want to talk about. Number three, recommending something to Congress. They sent a letter to Congress. They said, here's what we've done. And what we'd like you to do is to consider our proposal. And our proposal is send this out to the states. And when the states nine of them agree, then you should consider this Constitution ratified. You know, I send letters that violate the Constitution all the time to Congress. And, you know, I don't get arrested. I haven't been arrested. Well, I have been arrested once with, with this guy over here but, um, in the Democracy Spring protest. But it had nothing to do with my recommendations to Congress. So the convention sending a recommendation to Congress is not illegal. What is illegal is this. What violated the rules was this. When Congress said, hell yeah, this is a good idea. The Constitution says unanimous, we don't like unanimous, let's try nine. That was the illegal act. Wow. And then what followed after that was, according to the original Constitution, illegal. But this detail is really critical, because when they say there's a precedent out there. We have to understand what the precedent was. What was the illegal act that they're fearful is going to repeat itself? Right? 
They're fearful that when it happens, some constitutional historians can stand up and say, this illegality, this happened in 1787, so it's therefore okay. Right? So let's map out what that could be. The precedent they say is Congress ignored the express rules for how to ratify amendment. That is the only precedent here of an illegal act. Okay, let's think about it now. Let's imagine we convened a convention. Let's say it's a convention that was convened for the purpose of considering campaign finance reform. We can dream. <laughs> and uh, the convention is convened after, uh, you know, let's state legislature say you're going to consider campaign finance reform. And, mid and midway through the convention, apologize for this tragedy, describing a tragedy like this, because I'm sure in America some of you have been touched by a tragedy like this, but imagine midway through the convention, there's another massacre at some school. And imagine the chairman of the convention's daughter has been slaughtered. And she comes to the convention and she says to the convention, these limits, they're bullshit. Total bullshit. What we should do is we should propose an amendment to abolish the Second Amendment. So she ignores the limits. And the convention feeling the emotion of the moment says, hell yeah. And they vote unanimously to abolish the Second Amendment. And then they say, you know, this is not going to pass three fourths of the states. But if we had a referendum, a national referendum, it would pass. So here's our idea. Send our proposal to abolish the Second Amendment to Congress. But in that proposal, recommend a new way of ratifying. This amendment. Say this amendment will be law if a national referendum finds at least 60% of American support. Okay, so perfectly parallel to what the frame is doing. Frame has said this is a disaster, we're going to write a new constitution, and we're going to propose a new way of amendment. Okay, now we get to the precedent. And I want you to imagine Speaker Pelosi. Hard for some of you, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, she raises the most money of anybody, but she also has now moved that the next Congress, if it's a Democratic Congress, will consider campaign finance as a top issue in the first weeks of the Congress. So you've got to give her something. So imagine Nancy Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi, is so moved, she is so moved by the tragedy and the, and the drama that she gets this letter from the convention that says, this will be amended if 60% ratified in a national referendum. And she says, that's a great idea. And now she says to Congress, let's do it. Let's send it out to the states and say to the states, only 60% in a national referendum need to adopt this, and that will be part of the Constitution. Here's the question. Here's the obvious, totally obvious question. Does anybody believe? <laughs> that Nancy Pelosi has the power to change the rules for ratifying the amendment of the Constitution. Does anybody believe that if some constitutional law professor stood up and said, oh, you know, you know, Second Amendment people, actually what she's doing by saying that there's going to be a different way to ratify the amendment is exactly what the framers did. So therefore it's okay, totally okay. Does anybody believe that there would take more than two hours for the Supreme Court to be thinking <laughs> about this proposal. And despite the Supreme Court saying again and again, you know, we don't really think we should think about amendment processes, does anybody believe that the Supreme Court in one court would say, hell no, look at the plain words of Article 5. The plain words of Article 5 say, the only way to amend the Constitution is if three-fourths of the states agree with it, whether you like that or not. And I don't like it at all, but that's what's in the words of Article 5. My point is, this whole idea that we could copy the illegal precedent and fear that that illegal precedent would somehow render our Constitution vulnerable is not even imaginable in real political terms. It is just bullshit used by people who want to embed the status quo by terrifying people who don't have 10 minutes like you've just taken to work through the obvious idiocy in this argument. <laughs> the point is, it is not even plausible 
that the Supreme Court would allow them to do what the framers of our Constitution did for a thousand reasons. But the most obvious, the Supreme Court hates Congress, and the Speaker of the House, whether Republican or Democrat, is that they're changing the rules for amending the Constitution. It would be left out of court in 10 minutes. We have to do better in making this absolutely obvious argument clear to everyone. We have to call bullshit. I'm sorry, my daughter's She's playing Fortnite. She knows I'm not into it. So. <laughs> we have to find a way to make it so people don't follow this idiocy to the point that we can't do anything about it. Because these unimaginable dangers, these dangers they talk about, which are literally unimaginable once you unpack it, are blocking the opportunity for us to address certain disasters. And I don't mean certain as in particular, I mean certain as we will certainly have a disaster in this democracy if we don't find a way to fix this constitution. It is absolutely clear that we are destroying the capacity for self-government. And unless we change this system, constitutionally, we can't recover it. That is a certain disaster. And these unimaginable dangers are stopping too many people from addressing that certain disaster. So, when you ask why, you ask what these groups are, what these reform groups are, the truth is what really is behind this is these are people who are deeply skeptical. They would say of state legislators, but I think what they're really skeptical of is representative democracy. What they're really skeptical of is the people. What these people are, are keen to keep control in the elite for how our constitution evolves. I don't know if Cenk may tell this story. I'm sorry if you're going to ruin your story here, but Cenk and I met with the head of Common Cause before the election. We're trying to lay out the argument for Article 5, and he's a smart guy, and he's a good guy. At that moment, you know, he was like, why should we risk it when, you know, Hillary will just appoint the justices we want and uh, we'll fix the constitutional problem that way? Now, of course, I haven't had a chance to talk to him after that about how his calculation is now different, <laughs> given that Hillary is not yet, maybe her email is appointed a justice, I don't know, but there's no <laughs> Hillary justice out there. So I don't know how his calculation is different, but the reality is, as we know, we who've dealt with these people know, these people are deeply elitist. And they are so cynical and skeptical of the capacity of America to deal with their constitution that the idea of self-government dealing with the founding document of self-government is just beyond them. They can't imagine it. Now, you know, don't get me wrong. Look, I'm a Harvard Law professor. I make elite people for a living. This is my job. <laughs> and, I, and I don't mean to say that I'm anti-elite. Like, I think it's good to have, you know, a couple of smart people in the room. But we have tried elite constitutionalism long enough. We have tried the system where we allow the elite to fix our problems long enough, and they haven't fixed our problems yet. And so I think for far too long, <coughs> this attitude of handing our constitution over to the senior elites, lawyers, and law professors, <laughs> for far too long, that's been the way we think about constitutional law. And what this movement is, I think, most excitedly about is a movement to bring the people back in to the constitutional room, to bring the people back into the process of describing what should be the rules that govern us because they are our rules. We, the people, are governing ourselves, or that's the theory, and let's at least find a way to fight for that theory. This elitism has produced a constitution ever more remote from the people. We have to try something different. We have to try a constitution, finally, again, for the people. Okay, I want to make one final point and I want to stop. 
I think no one takes seriously enough in this debate that this movement cannot be, cannot be, it cannot seem to be partisan. It cannot be and it cannot seem to be partisan. That doesn't mean partisan sides can't rally for a convention. But the movement cannot be a partisan movement. Because if it is partisan, then it will fail. And the mechanism of its failure should be obvious to us. If there were a right-wing convention, which is the most likely outcome, of the current Article 5 movement. The most likely outcome is that there will be, in the next five years, a convention called for the purpose of dealing with an issue that America perceives as a right-wing issue. That will be a gift to the Democratic Party. It will be the gift of a money printing machine to the Democratic Party. You've already get, you're already getting these emails from the Democratic Party. The DCCC writes these emails saying, the right wing is about to destroy our Constitution, and so what we need to do is to rally to stop the convention movement. And they love it, because fear and uncertainty and distrust produces extraordinary amounts of money for their coffers, and so they get hundreds of millions of dollars in this fight if this fight actually were produced by there being a right wing convention out there. And the same thing with a left-wing convention, or what's perceived as a left-wing convention. It would be a gift to the Republican Party, a money printing machine, which they would exploit by talking about how we're going to destroy the First Amendment, and we're going to destroy the Second Amendment, we'll destroy the, th well, who cares about the Third Amendment? But the point is, <laughs> they will terrify their base, and their base will send all of their money to the Republican Party. Either way, we have to see, we have to hear what the consultants will say. The consultants, I love this graph, will be licking their chops, get it? They'll be licking their chops. Yeah, cat video, how can you go wrong? They will be licking their chops when they recognize, so you must resist it. The consultants will love the world of a partisan convention because it gets them what they need, more money. You must resist it, we must resist it actively. I don't think we've done enough not to oppose but to support a cross-partisan Article 5 convention or a brace of conventions. The understanding that it would be two immediately or one that can consider two sides. I think that it's critical for us to say I support an Article 5 convention that would consider issues affecting the issues I care about, what I call representational integrity, all the ways in which we've allowed special interests to corrupt our election process. But I support that, as well as a convention that has the opportunity to consider what we could call fiscal responsibility, what I think are disastrous ideas, but let them consider it. I support both because that's the only way for either to have a fair shot at making their ideas debatable among the people in the states so that three-fourths of the states have the chance, the opportunity to actually ratify it. I support this not as a Democrat, not as a former Republican, but I support this as a citizen first. That's got to be our movement. That's what inspires me to join your movement. Brings me back to saying I'm not sure that what's necessary is possible. All that I'm sure of is it's necessary. And so if there is inspiration that it is possible, then let's just go for one minute back to this extraordinary event. So when people look at this painting, they think, what's the diversity here? These are a bunch of white men over 50. Uh, well, you know, not all of them, but you know, they're, they're all pretty old. They're all pretty old. Okay, and no doubt, no doubt the single most important blindness of our framers was their obliviousness to the issues of equality as it affects race and sex and wealth in certain respect, but I would quibble about that. Okay, fine. 
But we should recognize this is an incredibly diverse group of people. In this mix, there were people who believed slavery was the moral abomination of the age. And people who believed slavery was a natural power that any free society should be allowed to exercise. There could be no difference as fundamental as that. But what they could do was to bracket that difference long enough to craft a constitution to save the republic. Now, I'm the first to say maybe that was a bad thing. <laughs> you know, for the slaves, it was certainly a bad thing. Because what it did was embed that system, which many people think if there hadn't been a republic, slavery would have been over in 10 years, 15 years, because it couldn't have survived without the support of the North. So maybe that's true. But my point is not to say it's a great thing to have a constitution that embedded slavery. My thing is to say, my point is to say, if they could bracket the hardest moral struggle there is, we should be able to bracket our arguments about health care or the minimum wage. We should be able to say, I'm not giving up my fight. I'm not telling you I'm not going to fight for this. But we should be able to say, let's fix what we know is broken so that we can get back to a government that could actually deal with it. That's what they did. They could put aside those differences, and so too must we. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.